Good day, Clark. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. No worries, Guy. A pleasure as always. Well, today we're going to talk about your latest book, Make It Meaningful. And there's more to the title here. So it's Making It Meaningful, Taking Learning Design from Instructional to Transformational. But before we get into the book itself, for those in our audience who aren't familiar with you and your work, could you give us a little bit of your professional background? Sure. As an undergraduate, I saw the connection between computers and learning. Uh, we didn't have a program in that, but I, we had a program where you could design your own program. I designed my own program, and it's been my career ever since. It's taken strange twists and turns. <laughs> um, I was designing educational computer games, designing and programming them, went back to Realized we didn't know enough, went back to grad school, got a PhD in what was effectively applied cognitive science, did a postdoc and was an academic for a few years uh, for family reasons, came back to the U.S., joined a startup. And then for the past couple decades now, I've been a consultant to organizations helping them use technology in ways align with how our brains think, work, and learn. Thank you for that. So now let's shift to your book, Make It Meaningful, Taking Learning Design from Instructional to Transformational. So I have a three-part question here to before we get into the specifics of the book, but who did you write this for? Why did you write it? And what do you hope the key takeaways are for the readers? I'm going to change the order of that. I'm going to talk about why I wrote it first and talk about who that's for. The... I've been in designing learning experiences that are engaging because of that first experience designing and programming educational computer games. That's been a recurrent theme throughout my career. In fact, my first book was How Do You Design Games for Learning? And it keeps recurring. And this new phrase, learning experience design, I'm actually excited about because I think learning experience design is the elegant integration of learning science and engagement. There are now resources, increasing numbers of resources about the learning science and including my own previous book, um, but lots of good resources. And yet I felt, you know, so if that exists, what exists on the engagement side? And I didn't, I looked around and there's some guidance, but I didn't feel like it was a good how-to. So that's why this book exists is to try and help people after they understand the learning science, understand the engagement side and how to integrate them. That suggests that who this is for is people who have mastered the basics of learning design but wanna take it to the next level, take it to the opportunity that exists. As I recited in the closing of the book, and that transformational is really aspirational. It's a direction I'd like people to get to, to think about. But it was drawn from a book Pine and Gilmore wrote called the experience economy. And they said, you know, we've gone from agricultural to product to service economy. And they argue we're now in an experience economy. We see themed events that are experiences. And that wasn't what really intrigued me. What intrigued me was what they suggested was the next economy. That was the transformation economy where we pay for experiences that change us in ways that we want or need to, to happen. And that's what I suggest when learning designers are on their game, that's what they do. They change people, but it's got to be because we're understanding both the science of learning, what works cognitively, but also we find out that their research suggests that we learn better when we're emotionally engaged as well. How do you do that systematically, reliably, repeatedly? So people who want to get that, and that's the takeaways. That's the takeaways I'd like people to get are to understand what it takes and how to do it. And leaving with understanding the nuances for each of the elements, and then how do you systematically do that repeatably, reliably, and systematically? Thank you. All right then, well, let's, let's take a look at your book a little bit more closely. Um, there's two sections to the book. The first is titled Principle, and the first chapter is learning and engagement. What, what can you share with us about that first chapter? Well, that first chapter sort of sets the ground rules. We do need to establish what learning really is about. 
And there's a pretty simple framework to me. And granted, this is oversimplification, and yet I think it's relevant. When we think about our own learning, learning informally, learning on our own or learning for things that we enjoy, learning is action and reflection. We have to do it. And then reflection can be feedback from others. It can be our own pondering on it. That suggests then that what instruction should be is designed action and guided reflection. So we design the experience and then we facilitate the reflection around that. That is a premise. And then we talk about in that chapter, we'll talk about the roles that emotion plays, what we know about how that uh, makes the process more effective. Thank you. All right. So in chapter two and three, I'm going to read both of these titles and then we'll walk through each one of them. But the first chapter two is Hook'em and then chapter three is Landon. So what's that all about? Uh, it's a bad fishing metaphor, of course. Um, and I'm not a fisher person. So, you know, but the notion is that we there, I break this emotional component of learning into two aspects. And the first thing is you have to open up learners I suggest initially, even before you start the cognitive awakening, we know cognitively that if we activate relevant knowledge, the learning is gonna stick better. But I suggest people also have to emotionally go, you know, I do need this. And a couple more elements that go into that. But the point is we need to get people committed to saying, I'm going to engage in this learning experience then. So that has to happen in the beginning, and that's what that Hook'em chapter is about. But once we've got their commitment to the learning experience, we shouldn't let them down. We need to take them from that initial commitment through to the final you know, outcome where they leave confident enough to be willing to try it out in the workplace after the learning experience or wherever else they're expected to perform. So that third chapter about Landon is about how do we deliver on that commitment that we made with the hook. Thank you. That demystifies that. That's great. <laughs> chapter four then is some tips and tricks. So uh, what can you share with us about the tips and tricks that you're uh, speaking to in that chapter? Well, there are lots of heuristics. We have some good evidence, but they don't always all need to be applied. What we want are to figure out what are the right tools we have, leverages to try and make that experience more engaging. So we, there's um, you know, ele elements like a humor and story and challenge that we really want to make sure we understand the nuances of. So when we apply that in the design process, we know how much to use and where to stop. You know, you can overdo all this stuff and that's as bad as not doing it at all. It's time to go beyond that, you know, bullet, death by bullet point type of learning experience. What does it take and what are the tools we have and what are their limits? When do they make sense? I want it just to help unpack. And this is drawing on elements that come from, uh, th there's an initial alignment I talk about that talks about how effective education practice and engaging experiences, they have elements that actually perfectly align. If you understand that, you can reliably, repeatedly create what I call hard fun. But you need to know which to use when, and what I try to do there is, is help unpack information that comes from drama and uh, live action role playing and amusement parks and games and figure out how do these work? How do we apply them? How do we make sure we don't overuse them? Thank you. So the, sec the second section is uh, titled Practice. And the first chapter of that, number five, is Implications. What's that about? It's all well and good to have all this theory, but you got to put it into practice, right? And we have some known elements of learning that serve different roles and combine to create a total learning experience. So we can go back to, you know, Gagne and his nine elements of instruction. And in this case, we're talking about the introduction to the experience, the initial concept or model you use to, that will guide your performance, examples that show how that concept plays out in context, the practices where you apply those concepts in practice, and then the closing as well, 
we too often just say, okay, you're done, instead of actually recognizing the necessary cognitive and emotional closure that it makes a learning experience most successful. So what I do is go through each of those, briefly mention the essential learning science components, but focus on what the emotional aspects add to those so that you can recognize as you go through what makes a good part of that and then it becomes the issue about tying them together. And to wrap it up in chapter six, you titled that a design process. What are you sharing with the reader there? One of the things I've recognized <laughs> through a fair amount of experience is people don't like to change their whole design process, right? They don't wanna throw it out and say, oh, I have a new one. So what I want to do is indicate the elements that you need to modify and how they need to be modified in your design process. So I use a generic design process that starts with analysis and then specification and uh, implementation and evaluation, and it includes iterative as well. And I go through a design process, generic design process, and talk about what we need to do differently at each of these steps. So that you, you know, my intent is not for you to adopt my design. My intent is for the reader to adapt in your one of your phrases, adopt what you can adapt the rest. Um, I'm looking for people to adapt their design process to incorporate these elements to make their learning more effective. Thank you. Yeah, and I read the book just uh, just this last week here, and I highly encourage others to uh, check it out and to uh, obtain it and to read it and learn from it. But let, so that brings us into, so where can our audience find out some more information about the book and what formats is it available in and where can they purchase it? Um, you, you can purchase it most everywhere. Uh, we, I've checked, it's now available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes and Noble. The best place to get it uh, is so I'm part of the Learning Development Accelerator. It was started by Matt Richter and Will Talheimer. Will Talheimer um, couldn't make the commitment needed. They had me join with Matt to be running this small society based on evidence-based principles with active, you know, programming and events to help people understand good learning science and engagement in the rich picture in the L&D. One of the initiatives is LDA Press. This is uh, Matt's brainstorm was he thought we should be a publisher as well. And having seven books, I've got a wee bit experience. I've also, you know, well, six books up to this one. And uh, I've also done some consulting and work with publishers. So I understood a lot of, you know, what was required and what wasn't. And Matt had experience as well, publishing books for, you know, the Theagi group. Together, we've created a press. This book is the first output of LDA Press. We don't intend it to be the only one, but the focus is on books that address particular niches in the learning and development space that haven't been uh, well addressed or need a refresh. We are, the underlying premise is to make the books, make the relationship with a publisher that authors would like to have. So we are looking to have uh, greater freedom, copyright control, better royalties, and we are doing both eBooks and print. So Make It Meaningful is already available in eBook. The print versions, you can order their fulfillment. My own copies are coming later today. Um, but so one place you, you can go to Amazon, you can go Barnes Noble, but I recommend going to ldaaccelerator.com ldaccelerator.com, yes, stroke lda-press. And that's where you can find out more information about the book. You can find out, uh, and you can actually order it through um, that site. Of course, you can find out more information at quinnovation.com. I have a section for my books and the top one now is the Make It Meaningful and click a link. There's a page on it and a link off to LDA Press as well. So you don't have to remember anything but quinnovation.com or ldaccelerator. Dot com and you will get there. Well, thank you. I will put uh, those URLs in the uh, YouTube show notes here so that people can uh, follow up a little bit more easily. Um, 
Clark, thanks so much for uh, sharing all of this with us today uh, and sharing your wisdom and insights, not only through this book and your other books, but for your many contributions to the profession. Uh, thanks so much and have a great day. I want to thank you, Guy, for the opportunity to talk about it and your work and contributions as well. You're most welcome. Have a great day. Bye.